Well, hello there, friends, lovers. Thank you for joining me. This is Five Minutes with Robert Naser. Man, that was the old name of the show. Amy's not here tonight. She's out. She's out doing bridesmaid things. Yeah, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. No, she's already done that once. Thank goodness. Whew. But thank you. Thank you for joining me. And thank you for keeping me company. I have got the chat up. And I see both Paul and Christopher Smith who is saying cue the bass again. Hello, Greg, as well. Good to see you there on the Facebook side. Where is Jim? I know he will come along soon on Facebook. But yes, thank you for joining me. Today is Sunday, the 14th of April, two weeks into April, episode 207. I say things are looking up. What the hell are you talking about? Iran just attacked Israel in the middle of what is already six months of war. No, we're going to talk about, well, we are going to talk about that. That's important. But I do want to hear from you in the chat. Oh, Jim on YouTube says his clone is here. And it will be more than just the three of us. Yes, it absolutely will. Today is Sunday, April 14th, the 105th, 105, 105th day of this, your best year yet, 2024. Good so far. Great in places, but the best year yet, I'm still working on it. I hope you are too. It is good and getting greater all the time. 261 days left to make it your best year yet. 255 days until Christmas. Amy's not here. I'm not going to do the Thanksgiving thing. Ha! There we go, finally. And we have just 67 days until summer. Two days ago here in Motown, Southeast Michigan, United States of America. It was cold. It was wet. It was rainy. Yesterday, I was out on a bicycle. You know, I forget who it was. Maybe Heinlein said, climate is what you expect. Weather is what you get. Whether it's good or bad, whatever it is, make the best of it. On this date, April 14th, a couple quick ones here that are, well, as always, we're going to time together. On this date, the first American Abolition Society was founded in Philadelphia. Hmm. Half calf. At six o'clock in the evening here, Sunday night. I'm gonna cut back in the caffeine a little bit. It's funny I didn't have any half calf Keurig cups. And I thought, well, then I'll just have regular cup. Or maybe I'll have a decaf. I've got both of those. Wait a minute. Why don't I make a cup of decaf and a cup of regular coffee and then take half of each of those? And you think, well, those Keurigs are expensive. Isn't that a waste to dump half of it out? No. No, you should have everything you want exactly as you want it. If you have a creative idea to make that happen, make that happen. Money, money's like Doritos. Crunch all you want, we'll make more. But seriously, on this date, the first abolition society founded in Philadelphia in the United States. What's so interesting about that? What's interesting about that? The Society for the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage. There's a unwieldy name. Uh, nowadays, it's just called the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. And yes, they do still exist. The Society for the Relief of Free Negroes Unlawfully Held in Bondage was the first American abolition society founded April 14th, this day, 1775. Yes, the year before the United States was officially the United States. 1775. Uh, they held meetings. 17 of the 24 men who attended initial meetings of the society were Quakers. Well, that's one up for them. Uh, Quakers, I mean, goofy, goofy religion. But, you know, if you've seen High Noon, uh, Quakers were hot. But, seriously, members of the Religious Society of Friends, a branch of Christianity notable for early history in Pennsylvania. Ben Franklin was there. Ben Franklin was elected as the organization's president. And yes, he did try to get slavery stricken down in the writing of the American Constitution. Unfortunately, as you know, tragically, he was not successful in that endeavor. The Pennsylvania Abolition Society does still exist, dedicated to the cause of fighting racism, the oldest abolitionist organization in the United States. Amazing, amazing stuff. We'll tie it together, but first, happy April 14th, National Ex-Spouse Day. I was surprised to find out that's a holiday, but there are people who celebrate na it's ex-spouse day. You know, I talked before. Oh, Jeff Banster is in the chat. How cool, Jeff. I hope you are doing well. Jeff is facing challenges bravely and well and sharing some of that on the socials. It's good to see you in 
the chat. Apollo Zeus is in as well. And uh, hello in the UK. And no, I'm not going to try to do a decent, I won't even do a bad British accent, actually. But yes, yes. And Jim Ashley asks whether we've seen The Great Escape yet. No, that has not happened yet, but it is on our to-do list. Uh, he says, yeah, he watched it last night, just got it on the Criterion Collection DVD edition. For those of you collecting DVDs, the Criterion Collection, well, well mastered set. And don't you deserve the best? Hint, yes, you do. So there you go. Yes, it's National Ex-Spouse Day. Now, I've talked about this before, so I'll make it quick. You should be friends with your exes, or at least have reasonable friendships with them. I know, I know. I've got exes I'm not friends with. I know sometimes you find out something that turns everything upside down, but in the vast majority of cases, that should not be happening. You should not be dating. You should not be sleeping with people you don't know well enough that they can't then later surprise you so badly, unless they just completely changed, that you would then say, this person I loved, I admired, I wanted to be with, this person I shared everything with is horrible and I hate them now. And that, that's so weird to me that that's such a common thing. So I love the fact that there is a national ex-spouse day. And yes, the, the mother of my daughter, who is not Amy, not my wife now, um, is, is one of our best friends, both mine and Amy's best friend. And that is as it should be. Why were you together with somebody for any substantial amount of time if there wasn't at least something real there. So happy National Ex-Spouse Day. Hey, if you've got an ex-spouse and it's a bad scene, let it be a bad scene. Grieve for it. Let them go. But hopefully there's not as much of that as some of my friends when I was younger made it out to be. Okay, complete flip over the record from side A to side B. Does anybody remember records when you flip them? Anyway, it's also the International Moment of Laughter Day. And that I am all about. So the crazy thing is, I talked about you can change your state, your state of mind, your state of your emotions, the state of your consciousness by changing your posture, by changing your environment. We talked about this. Put on some of your favorite music and everything changes. But another great one is put on a comedy. Um, and if a movie isn't enough to do it, put on like a comedy special, like, you know, a comedy routine where you just, you know, sit and listen to somebody just joke, joke, joke for a full hour. And you don't even have to wait for them to come on TV anymore. You just go onto your services or go onto YouTube, find a comedian that you like or somebody you think you might like that you haven't heard before. Big laughter changes your state, recharges you, and now you're ready to deal with that challenging thing. We're going to talk about that challenging thing, whatever it was that you were facing Real quick, a couple of happy birthdays. Happy 84th birthday to Julie Christie, uh, since Jim Ashley is in the chat and knows more about movies than you'll ever forget. Uh, my favorite Julie Christie film, I know people will think this is silly, but uh, Heaven Can Wait, Warren Beatty, 1978. I just thought that was super charming, or maybe I just saw it at an age when I was really impressionable, but uh, Heaven Can Wait, yes, yes, the later one with, with Warren Beatty and... Julie Christie. Julie Christie, incidentally, showed up in, of all places, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. She was the uh, barmaid, Madame Rose Merta. So happy, mm, still with us, happy 84th birthday to Julie Christie. It's also Sarah, Sarah Michelle Geller's birthday. Now, I'm not a horror movie fan, so I don't know if I've ever seen any of her movies. Um, you know, I Know What You Did Last Summer and Scream 2 and Cruel Intentions. I don't I might have seen the Scooby-Doo film. Does that really count as a monster or a horror film? Probably not. Sort of fits. But Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Come on. Give it up for Sarah Michelle Gellar. 47 years old today. Even though, you know, I have that quirk of still preferring the Buffy film to the television series. I know that's blasphemy with some of my relatives, but come on. The movie was so good. I know it's not canon. You know, even Joss Whedon has said, no, the movie, they made it different than I wanted it to be. The TV series is canon. Well, not not in this head of mine. So there we go. Absolutely. Uh, let me just catch up, catch up on the chat. Jeff Bannister points out records. Yeah, vinyl albums are coming back. It's, it's weird that CDs died out, but then vinyl started coming back. 
And it's cool. It's a different listening experience. And we can argue about which sounds better. It comes down to so many, many elements uh, with your CD. What's your DAC look like? Your digital analog converters. How much of your amplifier is actually analog? Or if it's digital, how good digital is it? Bottom line is there's nothing quite like putting a vinyl record on a turntable, lifting up that tone arm, setting it down on the record album, and watching it reproduce the music for you. And then, of course, on a really good stereo, very, very loud, put on a copy of the Yes album, Going for the One, and you are in ecstasy for 48 minutes. Or whatever. whatever. Pick your poison. Uh, by which I mean pick all the good stuff. Uh, I did not know that Julie Christie was in Fahrenheit 451. I haven't seen that since I was young. Uh, but thank you for that, Jim Ashley. And second favorite is Finding Neverland. We watched Finding Neverland. I remember we enjoyed it, but strangely enough, I can't actually remember it, which means I need to watch it again. So that is good to hear as well. Uh, sorry, I, I've just got, I've just got to read some of this chat. For example, Christopher Smith is saying, Heaven can bite me. Heaven can wait is, is you know, there's, there, there, there are so many films that have religious plot points, including Heaven and, and the Afterlife. And the one that I haven't seen yet, but everybody tells me that I need to see is Defending Your Life. Uh, is that Albert Brooks? Somebody will tell me. Let me know if you think I need to see Defending Your Life. It's been recommended to me before. Absolutely. And Christopher Smith says, the lyrics, the experience. I do know people who think lyrics don't matter. Oh, I don't even listen to the lyrics. I don't know the words. I just like the music. I'm okay with that. I don't have a problem with the idea of pure music. Um, but I like lyrics. I think lyrics matter. And my favorite rock band is the band Yes, in which half the time the lyrics don't appear to make any sense. Uh, they make a certain poetic sense. They are evocative rather than literal. But I love it. I love lyrics as much as I love music. Or rather, I love lyrics as music. And uh, yeah, Christopher confirms that that is an Albert Brooks film. Uh, but no, I haven't, haven't seen it yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments in the chat and for keeping me amused. So, yes, yes. Thank you, Sarah Michelle Geller, for... Uh, Having your birthday today and giving us Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The next happy. It is, here's two holidays. And these aren't completely paper holidays. I did find people do celebrate these two. It is happy today, April 14th. National Look Up at the Sky Day. And it is also Reach as High as You Can Day. These are weird, right? They kind of throw away holidays, but it, I've got references for these. I'm surprised somebody else may be thinking about these the same way that I am, and I'm loving it. National Look Up at the Sky Day. You know, we had that that terrible dystopian film, and I'm saying it's terrible even though I've only seen clips online. I've never watched it. The film last year, Don't Look Up. And the idea was that, you know, the world's about to end and maybe we can do something. I think an asteroid's going to hit the Earth. Maybe we can do something about it. But let's let's just deny it. Let's not look up. Let's evade. No, I love this idea of National Look Up at the Sky Day. It makes me think of Gail Winand in the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. You know, his, his head thrown back. He felt the pull of his throat muscles. And he wondered whether the peculiar solemnity of looking at the sky comes not from what one contemplates, but from that uplift of one's head. We see a scene like that with Howard Rourke looking up at the Enright House and this news photographer is just struck by the look and takes a photograph of him. That comes up later in the story too. So yeah, I'm good with National Look Up to the Sky Day. But also Reach As High As You Can Day. I love the exercise. I've done this with you before. I'm going to do it again right now. If you are someplace where you can stand up, stand up. And if you can, get to a wall or somewhere else where you can touch something up there. If you're not, if you're in your car or something, do it in your head. Do it later. And what I want you to do is just reach up as high as you can. And that's why it's good to have a wall or something where you can actually touch the wall so you can see, this is how high I can reach. And feel it. You know, feel the stretch. Feel how, oh, you know what? 
when I'm really standing up straight, when I'm really fully focused, fully aware, really on top of my game, really here, really present, that is what I can do. I can get up there. Now, don't keep, keep reaching. Don't stop. Now, here's what I want you to do. Here's step two. Here's the, the next thing I need you to do is, is reach a quarter inch higher. And I've done this in person. We've done this at GlowCon with a room full of people. And I have never seen a person not be able to get another quarter inch out of them. So even though they were reaching as high as they thought they could. And, you know, they really were. They weren't faking it. They weren't being lazy. But you have always got a little more in you than you realize. And you can draw on it just by giving yourself that. Okay, give me a quarter inch more. Give me 1% more than I was doing a moment ago. So I love this idea of reach as high as you can day, and maybe it means different things to different people. <sighs> but I love that exercise. So happy look up to the sky day, April 14th. And there's some information about that in the show notes. If you look at the description on YouTube, there are links. And reach as high as you can day. And finally, uh, where are we at? Oh, shameless self-promotion. And what are we listening to this week? What are we listening to this week? Uh, let's see, let's see. I'm just looking at you here. Excellent song. Are we talking about the song Eclipse by uh, Pink Floyd? I looked for songs called Eclipse or about eclipses. Turns out there's a bunch of them, naturally. I think of Dark Side of the Moon, which uh, at some point me and Mark, the keyboard player, will do the whole album, I'm sure. Great gig in the sky. We might have to abbreviate some of the vocals. Neither one of us have the chops for that, but we could do a good piano version of it. That is coming. Chrissy Hines' low voice gets me as well as the guitar. Oh, which which uh, pretender song are we talking about? Do do do. Oh, oh, I went back to Ohio. The song "My City Was Gone." Yeah. Okay. I must admit, every time that song starts, I still think, "Oh, the Rush Limbaugh show." So, I I also love that story that Rush Limbaugh. And I was kind of a fan of that. I've always had disagreements with Rush Limbaugh, but at the time I was listening to his show. And he was the best. He was just the best in the world at what he did. It could not be denied, even if you disagreed with everything he said and hated half of it, which, you know, I did hate half of it, although I didn't disagree with all of it. He was the man for his times. But anyway, he would play the beginning of My City Was Gone uh, by the Pretenders at the beginning of his show. And at some point, somebody got in touch with his producers and said, yeah, uh, the pretenders, they don't want you to play that song. You've got to cut it out. And Limbaugh stopped doing it. And it was kind of a, annoying because we'd gotten used to that as the theme song, uh, the, the intro to that song, the opener, and then the cut into the guitar solo. It's just out. It's a great song, but it's also outstanding theme music. Turns out a few weeks later that, that Chrissy Hind um, let it be known. She didn't have any problem with him using the song. She didn't agree with Rush Limbaugh. She was... You know, far left, and he was far right, but she didn't have any problem with him using the song, and so he started using it again, which is good because it probably made her a boatload of money, and I'm sure it supported whatever causes she wanted, and he liked the music, so he used it. Very, very cool. And yes, Chrissy Hind is amazing. Um, there's so much about her story that is amazing. Uh, some of it's tragic, but some of it's just really, really inspiring. So I absolutely approve of that being one of your go-to songs. But under what we're listening to this week, what I've got is a um, couple things that are completely other opposite ends of the spectrum. No, not the political spectrum, although that too. War with Iran, as it happens. Well, that was the title of Yarn Brooks show yesterday. Originally, he was going to do his usual Saturday show. In fact, on Saturdays, he usually intentionally does a show with a positive topic. Yesterday, it was War with Iran, as it happened. He ends up going on for, for just about five hours. Now, I don't know how many of you were paying attention to what was going on in the Middle East yesterday, but you probably know that after Israel's strike on Iran's... Uh, Oh, what diplomatic group was it where? Now, I forget the story, but it, Israel did something earlier, a month ago. And Iran's like, we're going to get him back for this. And the amazing thing is that Iran actually did it. That they practically started a war. We'll see if they've really started a war. They, they lobbed hundreds, hundreds of ballistics and other weapons at Israel. Now... 
Iran is not next to Israel, so that's a long flight. And some of these these drones and ballistic missiles and and uh, weaponry is going it's going over Jordan and Jordan and shooting them down. You know, it's it's but most of the weaponry did make it to Israel's airspace, where Israel's defense forces, the Iron Dome, shot it all down. A few did land and did mostly trivial damage. Unfortunately, there was damage to one home uh, where a seven or eight year old girl was injured, not killed, but injured still, very tragic. And basically, if, don't say basically, I always hear people say basically is a hedging term, so I should never say basically, but I'll say it flat out. If this had happened to any other nation, any nation but Israel, and, and a nation with the self-esteem to do something about it, it would have been war. This, this was an act of war. And James Valiant was talking about this earlier on the Ayn Rand Center UK channel, making the very good point, which was my immediate reaction, which is if this had happened anywhere else, if they didn't have the Iron Dome and the other self-defense forces, the, the automatic weaponry that can shoot down these kinds of incoming ballistics, there would have been mass death and there would have been a mass response. And that's what should have happened anyway. By what right does anybody say, oh, what Iran did, sending over 200 missiles into Israel? Well, it's trivial because Israel's defense forces are so strong, because their self-defense is so good, because they can stop all of that, or at least most of it. I mean, some of it was a crapshoot. Some of the stuff did get through, and it's fortunate that it didn't land in heavily populated areas. So is the right response to say, well, Israel is so strong and they've got it together so good, eh, let Iran do that thing. No, this is an act of war. And so I absolutely agree with everything that Yaren Brooks said during his <laughs> marathon five-hour episode and uh, fortunately he got massive funding as it went it started to look like one of those new year's eve shows where he raises thousands of dollars and he deserved every dollar of that support so if you haven't heard that episode war with iran as it happens it's pretty long but it's kind of compelling to hear as it happened we'll see what happens next with that the other thing that i've been listening to that i found really interesting was oh wait let me double check the chat here make sure i <laughs> See, it's so easy to say Israel is so strong and Iran's attempts were so poor, or rather so easily met, that you can just, like Christopher Smith said, nice try, bozos. <laughs> and it's the right response, but it's not necessarily the right military strategy. So I, I, will, I will say that each and other's audience outside the gilded cage. Yes, of course, Jennifer is quoting Rush songs as well as she should. As much as Yes is my favorite band, I've got to say, the best lyrics, the best lyricist in rock music ever. If you want to talk about actual content, you can say some rock bands rocked harder. Some composers were more poetic. But if you want to talk about lyrics that actually mean something, you know, both literally and metaphorically and poetically, I don't think you can do any better than Neil Peart. That's that's just just as good as it gets. Um, there's more artistic. I mean, you can go back to the Great American Songbook and you can find songwriters. Okay, there's a better songwriter than Neil Peart. But for actual lyrics that actually say something more than Moon, Spoon, June, Love, Neil Peart is uh, jaw-droppingly good. So yes, absolutely. Uh, but the other show, besides War with Iran as it happens, which again, I do recommend, was, I don't know if you've seen this yet, because this is the first in what may be a series on Mark Pellegrino's channel. Mark Pellegrino, of course, the great Hollywood actor and staunch objectivist and jujitsu master and all around great guy. He does an, a show called The Reality Check. And it's great. They're, they're well produced. You know, they're, it's not live like this where I just go on and on. No, these are cut and spliced and, you know, like a modern YouTube video. And the reality check is always objectivism oriented, reality oriented. Um, several episodes dealing with the war in Israel. 
But he did an episode which he just released, which is an interview or a discussion with Rick Rapetti, who is a philosophical psychologist, which is such a great combination, called Philosophy and Mental Health. I strongly encourage you to give that one a listen. It got me back on the bicycle yesterday. You know, I haven't gone on as many rides this year as I should. But man, I got to get back in shape, especially after hearing that episode. I heartily, heartily recommend it. Staunchly recommend that. Uh, just catching up in the chat here. Um, oh, Jim Ashley. that It's the kind of thing that we both loved and hated Rush Limbaugh for. He could be incredibly gauche, uh, uncouth, um, just low class when he discussed things like people he thought were low class. So Jim Ashley points out, Limbaugh once said something about Joan Jett and Chrissy Hind, contrasting their looks. He said, Chrissy Hind looks like you can catch a disease from her, but you wouldn't care. Joan Jett also looks like you could catch a disease from her, but you would care. Now, A, I don't have, I, I get the, the clever wordplay and that's why I left. A, I don't have that reaction to Joan Jett, nor Chrissy Hind. Although Chrissy Hind would probably fit the bill more. For, there are reasons why you should and would never say such a thing about Joan Jett. But, man, the guy was funny. Again, if, if you could let a lot of stuff roll off your back, there was nobody better at what he did than the late uh, Rush Hudson Limbaugh. Uh, even though he got, by the end of his, his career, I couldn't listen to him anymore. Once Donald Trump came on the scene, and he, some of you will know this, you'll remember this, he used to have the, the tagline, the Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies. Now, I'm not a conservative, and half of what I disagree with Limbaugh about was his conservatism and what that meant to him. But at least he stood up for something, and he did. He actually stood up for something. He could give little mini lectures about liberty, about freedom, about America, about good stuff. When Donald Trump came along, and Donald Trump explicitly said, I'm, I'm not ideological, and acted like it, and there were times when he said, I'm not even a conservative. Limbaugh, every time Trump did something horrible, would try to spin it. But it was so obvious that Trump was a denial of everything that Limbaugh had spent years lecturing us about in the Institute for Advanced Conservative Studies that he changed his tagline to the Institute for Anti left, or was it anti-liberal, anti-liberal studies. In other words, he stopped being for anything and stopped, started just being against, well, basically anti-woke and pro-Trump. He stood for nothing. He got to where, and it wasn't just the labels and the tagline he used. He actually, in his rhetoric, in his radio show, got to where he stood for nothing. And it was just, it was sad because he was getting older and we didn't know he was going to be dead four years later, but he was getting older and slowing down and the worst of him took over from the best of him. I only say all of this because, again, I was not, I did not agree with Rush Limbaugh and everything, but I admired the fact that he was incredibly good at what he, even if you hated what he did, he was incredibly good at it. He was enormously talented. Sad, sad stuff. Whereas otherwise in the chat, what if I told you that the Aerobulic, no, Aerobulic was now under the control of a Sith Lord known as Darth Kermit? Obviously, this is something I'm, I, Christopher Smith knows something I don't uh, hear. So, yes, I can't begin to imagine. Jennifer's agreeing, though, that, yeah, he did get worse and worse and worse. And it's sad because when he was good... He was the best. Uh, Christopher says, My favorite Limbaugh shtick was symbolism over substance. Yes, and he was good at that, and he was on from 12 to 3 on AM radio every day with millions of listeners. Now, there were better people talking about symbolism over, or substance over symbolism versus symbolism over substance. And Limbaugh acknowledged, you know, the, his intellectual peers and the people he admired. He even had guests on, like Thomas Sowell, who would talk about that quite a lot. Um, it's just sad that eventually he, he, he lost it. Uh, Apollo Zeus says, I've never heard of Limbaugh until recently. 
well, he was an American phenomenon in AM radio, and I don't know how much of that translated to overseas, but uh, when he was good, he was good. And there we go. So yeah, those two things were the sort of spectrum of what I've been listening to this week. And do encourage you to listen to the links to both of those are in the description on YouTube and I think on Facebook. I'll double check the Facebook side. Sometimes my multi-streamer doesn't carry the comments over, including the description with all these links. But it is in the YouTube description and it will be on Facebook as well. Now, hot topics for this week before I go too long. The New York Times coverage of what's going on in the Middle East is pretty good. So I have shared in the description a link to their coverage of what's going on in the Middle East. And you say, I hate the New York Times. They're leftists. Okay, well then, whatever. But if instead you said, I hate the New York Times because I'm not a subscriber and I can never read their stuff, that's why you need to follow my link. Because it's a guest link. Since I'm a subscriber, when I share a link, that link gets you in too. Now, the best coverage, and if you're not worried about being biased in favor of Israel, and God knows I am not worried about being biased in favor of Israel, uh, is the Times of Israel. So I've also linked to the Times of Israel website. Um, there were people on Twitter, I know Yaron was following one or two of them, who were ahead of the, uh, the ball, ahead of the curve, bringing the news on, the attacks, the information about the drones, about the ballistics, about the ICBMs, uh, excuse me, the cruise missiles. I guess, I don't know if those are inter, intercontinental ballistic missiles, cruise missiles. Yeah, those are two different categories. There were people on X, on Twitter, who were giving us that information even before the Times of Israel reported it. Trouble is, they're on X. So how reliable are they? Well, you know, you look at people who've been reliable in the past. Maybe you can count on them now. But if you don't have a news organization that's going to suffer some consequences for error, you got to take that a little bit with a grain of salt. The Times of Israel was pretty much right behind the people on X Twitter. Heartily recommend their coverage of what's going on, especially if this ain't over yet. And there's a good chance it ain't over yet. And I know a lot of people who believe it shouldn't be over yet. I'm one of them, although I'm still figuring out what I think that should look like. Not that President Biden or Benjamin Netanyahu are listening to me. I don't know. Maybe they are. Maybe I'd better be careful what I say on the internet. But the Times of Israel, highly, highly recommended. And uh, yeah, yeah, I love the Times of Israel reported, the U.S. was among several nations that intercepted many of the 170 Iranian drones heading toward Israel amid last night's attack. Uh, that number uh, was recently updated. Uh, the New York Times has it as the Israel military estimates that Iran and its proxies launched 170 aerial drones, 120 ballistic missiles, and 30 cruise missiles. Uh, but some of those actually came from Lebanon and from Hezbollah. Um, so follow the news at the Times of Israel. Follow it at the New York Times using the link I gave you if you don't have that uh, subscription. What was the other news? Before I wrap up, well, how AI is helping to prevent future power cuts. There's a story about uh, artificial intelligence being better used to manage uh, energy and, and not having to cut power the way that we have and get more out of what we've got. Southern Brazil reaps record soy. Food and hunger are being impacted in positive ways. A game-changer UTI vaccine stops infection for nine years. Uh, if you don't know what a UTI is, you don't care because it hasn't been part of your life. But if you know people who suffer from urinary tract infections, uh, usually a challenge for the ladies, this is a big fucking deal. Hi headline, Moderna. Moderna. Those are those Vax people. Yes, Moderna, inches nearer to a successful cancer vaccine. That's the one that I'm waiting for. When we have a vaccine against the major cancers, and cancer is many different things. You're not going to have one vaccine that ends cancer. But when we have vaccines against some of the major cancers, finally, will my friends who think everything about vaccines is a lie and a scam come on board? I mean, I, I know that there have been vaccine efficacies that have been overreported, that there have been vaccines that some people should think twice about taking. I am not. Take every vax no matter what and give it to your one and a half year old children, the whole battery of all 20 of them. No, I'm not that. 
But vaccines are awesome, or at least they can be awesome. They often are awesome, and they will be awesome. <sighs> Knock a few of the big cancers out? I think that'll bring some fans. Okay, why am I reading these headlines, these stories? And the answer is because they're in this week's Doomslayer. Doom, what's a Doomslayer? Well, the Human Progress folks. You know, it's a subsection of the Cato Institute, but they've got their own organization. Humanprogress.org. they got a project called Doomslayer. What do they do? They're publishing the good news every week. And I've only read you a few of the stories. There's, there's lists of them here. And my point is, is it crazy to say things are looking up at the same time as Iran, which should have been our target in 2003, and not Iraq. And believe me, if we could defeat Iraq, we could defeat Iran. The real people, well, not the real people, the real supporters of the people behind 9-11. If that's going on, if we are six months into a war in the Middle East, and half or more of the world, are they supporting Israel? No, no, I've got people down the street you know, we're in Motown here. Dearborn is next door. Chanting death to America. You know, it was actually really heartening to see the response to that, which was essentially negative, other than my representative, Rashida Tlaib, who I can't believe got elected. <sighs> Folks, she's the exception to the rule. The rule is, sadly enough, Joe Biden, who denounced Talib for this, denounced the people who would not criticize the chance of death to America. Uh, even a number of Democrats, and granted they're Jewish Democrats, but still you, you take your support where you can get it, are on board. The exceptions are horrible. And it's even worse when it's not an exception, when you've got uh, you know hundreds of thousands of college students who think because Israel is strong and Gaza is weak, because Israel is the oppressor and Gaza are the oppressed. That no matter what those bastards do, Gaza's the good guys and Israel's the bad guys. Yes, it's bad when that is the case. It is still the case that that is the exception to the rule. And for every bad news story you can share with me, I guarantee to match you that with five stories of good news out there. But good news isn't news. Good news isn't news. It's like when you're in your normal posture all day and then somebody tells you to reach up and you realize, oh my God, I can do so much more than I'm doing right now. I can be so much more aware than I am right now. I can be so much more focused than I am right now. I can do so much more with my life than I am right now. The world is so much better than I realize it is. There is so much more opportunity then, or maybe I do know it, but I don't feel it. It's not visceral. Like hearing that music and it gets into you, it gets under your skin and you feel it and you're like, oh my God, I'm alive. So I heartily encourage you, if you're not already, to become a subscriber of the Doom Slayer Project's newsletter and let them slay some of the doom that we all feel because there is real bad news out there. The dystopians are wrong. The pessimists are wrong. The cynics are more than wrong. They are shamefully wrong. But we don't always feel it. We don't always know it. We don't always have that viscerally in our skin. And I need to do a better job with that. We all need to do a better job with that. My post-it note for the week says, Cynicism is a lie. And this popped into my head earlier. And then I started looking around on the internet. Have I heard that before? It turns out that Michael Malice, of all people, was on Lex Friedman's, of all people, podcast with the title to their clip, Cynicism is a Lie. And it is. You know, Ayn Rand said there, there's nobody as, as, what's the word, impractical as a cynic. No, that's not the right word. I've got to look up cynicism now in the Ayn Rand lexicon, or maybe somebody can do that for me in the chat. What did Ayn Rand say about cynicism? Uh, or maybe it was skepticism, but not skepticism in epistemological skepticism, but in moral skepticism. So, a cynic. Uh, somebody will look that up. 
And uh, Greg, Greg Lewis says, I was called a cynic earlier. I disagreed. Yes, you, you don't strike me that way at all. And you've come to glow or Great Lakes Objectivist. So we have hung out and no, you are not a cynic. No, I, and I know cynics who will say, I am not a cynic, I'm a realist. No, cynicism is not realism. Skepticism is not realism. Optimism is realism. Because by every measure, I say every, and that's like saying literally, by nearly every measure, nearly everything is getting better all the time. Now, if you want stats, they're out there. Go to humanprogress.org or any of the other optimism-oriented websites that give you not happy, feel-good stories, although those are out there too, and that can be fun, but the numbers, the number of people coming out of poverty every year, the childhood mortality, infant mortality that is plummeting, numbers going down, um, meaning you know more of us survive our childhoods than ever before. The latest story, crime rates are down since the COVID years. You know, there's a brief spike in some kinds of crimes. Things were getting shut down. People were in states of despair. Some people weren't working, weren't getting any assistance. And so they were, you know, going out and committing those crimes. Crime rates are down. Uh, the amazing thing is if you look at the deaths due to military action, no, no, you don't have to go back as far as World War II. You, you don't even, even have to go back as far as the Korean War or the Vietnam War. Those numbers are down. Every measure, nearly every measure, nearly everything is getting better. All And for each of us. What do you mean for each of us? Well, <laughs> April 15th is tomorrow. How can you say things are getting better for us? Tax day is right around the corner. I think the official date this year might be the 17th. Whenever it is, we have to mail in our income tax returns. Uh, inflation. Inflation numbers are terrible. Uh, the stock market, well, it was at record highs, but it went back this week from those record highs. So it lost some ground. We're like down from 39 to 37,000. No. Getting better all... John Lennon was right. The Beatles were right when they sang... It's getting better all the time. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know there's plenty of bad news. And because of high technology, because of communications, because of the internet, because of modern news, you get those bad stories all the time. We just had some clown shooting at people from the rooftop in Marina Del Rey. You know, another so-called mass shooting. We had an actual mass shooting in Chicago. I won't make jokes about that one because somebody actually died in it. These things happen. And now you can look up historical murders and find them no end, but you don't hear about them immediately. You don't see cell phone videos of them when they happen. We are safer than we have ever been. We are more prosperous than we have ever been. We have access to communication we have never seen. Luxuries. You know, somebody was, who was it on the internet, was just showing this charming video of this charming woman walking through her houseboat. Her house, yeah, this this houseboat, a little houseboat, and it's like a luxury. It's not a yacht. It's just super charming. And the funny thing is, you can go on YouTube and watch those all day. You can look at, you know, homes of the rich and famous. You can look at technologies that are, you know, maybe only really rich people can afford. All of these new things are coming along, and the question is, if things are getting worse, how is this stuff happening? Oh, well, only the rich people have it. How is it happening if things are getting worse, even if they're super rich? And most of this stuff is available to us. I am still floored. I'm still jaw-dropped. I still can't believe my freaking iPad. Now, you kids, you won't get it. You won't understand. This, this thing, this like quarter-inch thick, thing that's like thinner than a legal pad except it's a supercomputer it's got a screen in it and it's got speakers and an internet connection and you know you know the whole list people show the photograph of oh here's the 48 devices that you know are all now sitting in your cell phone your pocket calculator and your music player and you're on and on and on and on and i just can't take any of that stuff for granted but here's the thing we think, well, you know, the iPhone was 2007, the iPad was 2011, 
what really amazing has happened since then? And then you look and you're like, oh, wait, you know, that was new and that was new and these new streaming services are new and these new studios have opened and this new music technology and the way in which, you know, anybody can has a music studio in their pocket now. Um, you know, arts and entertainment and and sports and we've got leagues now that we didn't even have 10 years ago and people are loving it. It just everything i everything is getting better all the time and it's like it just doesn't count it just doesn't freaking count because bad things are happening and as long as bad things are still happening uh yeah we got all this cool stuff yeah we've still got an amazing economy an amazing gdp constant inventions new businesses opening all the time the job market is outstanding opportunities every morning the biggest problem is not what is somebody going to make me do, but what am I going to choose to do with my day? And people don't understand that kind of freedom. They don't understand. Maybe it's because we don't have a Soviet Russia anymore. And even the borders in China are relatively open. And people just take for granted that they're not forced to do anything. But my message to you, because none of you would make this mistake, is do not take any of it for granted. Lord knows I don't. It's why I wake up grateful every morning. It's why I am motivated. It's why I am excited. And it's why I am, I'm grateful. I have gratitude. I have immense gratitude for everybody who makes all of this happen from the great innovators to the great businessmen, whether it's the inventors or the Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos, even Elon Musk, give him a little props. Um, but right down to my cashier, my hostess, my barista at the coffee shop, my mail letter carrier, uh, mail shouldn't be a government job. You're right, it shouldn't be a government job, but I love what she does, and I will keep fighting for that to be done privately, but I am just surrounded by it. You are surrounded by it. Let's appreciate it. Let's enjoy it, and more than anything else, let's bring it into our own lives. Because pessimism, here's my other post-it for the week, pessimism is a failure. It's a failure of your own selfishness. Don't let that happen to you. People, that's it. I went on long enough solo by myself. Man, I missed my bride. But she will be back next week. I will be back next week. And we will do this again. Thank you for your... <laughs> uh, Greg found the quote. Thank you. A cynic is one who believes that men are innately depraved, that irrational, irrationality and cowardice are their basic characteristics, that fear is the most potent of human incentives. Yes, that is cynicism. And even if you know somebody who's a cynic who is not out to manipulate people for those reasons, it's ruining their lives. Don't let it ruin yours. Absolutely not. Especially, especially the Ayn Rand fans, the objectivists, those of you who subscribe to the virtue of selfishness, the, the primacy of reason, you should be the last people. And I know most of you are, and I do appreciate that. Because if anybody should be happy, it's the people who believe that happiness is the purpose of life. If anybody should have self-esteem, if anybody should be rational about these matters, it should be the people who understand that the three highest values in life are reason, purpose, and self-esteem. If anybody should be enjoying life on earth, it should be the people who've got the owner's manual for life on earth. So let's do it. Let's have that good time. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. We will do this again next week. If you have any suggestions for future show topics, future show ideas, besides I know Jim's still waiting for that burlesque routine, and drunken podcasting will happen again, although I don't know how soon that's going to be, but your ideas too. Share them in the chat, share them in the five minutes with Robert and Amy Nacer Facebook group, or anywhere on the socials where you can feel free to reach out and communicate with us. I think I owe a couple of you messages back. I'm, I will jump right on that and get back to you this week. Feel free to reach out. Everybody reach out and do that thing. If you want to support the show, our Patreon remains open, and those of you who continue to contribute, thank you very much for that. It is heartening and keeps us going. Uh, go to robertnacer.com. You'll find Patreon and PayPal links if you want to support the show. 
And that's it. All that is left is for me to say thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me on this solo episode. And I do wish you every joy, every happiness, all the excitement and the goodness that you so richly deserve for being the awesome self that you are. Take a look in that mirror. That person deserves all levels of happiness because you are yeah, beautiful. Thank you. And as always, I know Amy does even though she's not here, but I absolutely, absolutely wish you happiness.